Morning, Fort Alliance. I also want to say good day to the extended digital family joining us online. Welcome into this space, to this time together. Going to start with a real quick question that I want you to get thinking on, okay? What is on your mind? Like right now, as you sit here, like what's on your mind? Rain. <laughs> Appreciate this. All. This is going to be a good morning, I can tell. Amen to that. Lord, we need rain. Please open the heavens. What do you spend your time thinking about? What do you spend your time doing? Think about that. Process that. Uh, this week, one of the things I spent some time on is hanging out at District Conference. I want to take a little bit to kind of fill you in on some of what happened. And for those of you who are newer to our fellowship, District Conference is the uh, kind of every other year in the, uh, the Christian Missionary Alliance, all the churches of Alberta in the Alliance get together and uh, as you know, pastors and lay leaders, we come together, we, we have the chance to pray together, we have this, the chance to dream together, to hear mess, the message and receive the word together, um, and, but we also have uh, the opportunity just to take care of some of the business stuff that has to happen in light of being connected to you know, 100 some other churches. Um, throughout Alberta. And so this particular uh, district conference, one of the things that we did was we elected a new district superintendent. And so if that seems kind of like weird language, he's kind of like the lead pastor of Alberta for the Alliance. And that's maybe the easiest way to explain that, if you will. And so, uh, yeah, our previous uh, district superintendent had completed its 12-year term. That's the max you're allowed to do. And so it was time to, uh, you know, elect or to, to, ha to enter the process of bringing someone else. And so uh, the new DS is Matt Boda, which is really exciting. And for a reason that's kind of neat for us is we are going to receive some serious benefits of Matt Boda being our new DS. A little while ago, he actually selected a pocket of young leaders that he was going to personally mentor and engage with. And one of them was our very own Ashley. So like, she gets personal mentoring from the lead pastor of all Alberta. How cool is that, hey? Whoop, win for Ford Alliance. It's gonna be a good era. He's uh, a very gifted leader. He loves people. He loves the church. He, he loves the province, and we're looking forward to being a part of that. Uh, a, a kind of a cool thing for me, this uh, district conference that uh, happened, is I actually got to hang out a lot of the time with my mom and dad as well. So they were uh, going to represent the, the church from Lloyd Minster. And so they were there as well, and we got to hang out. And they've never been at a district conference, never kind of seen uh, my world. And for those of you who don't know, my dad's a businessman, and he is connected to a group that's like throughout the nation uh, that he buys uh, product with and what have you. And so he gathers with a group of people regularly to like process business and what have you. And so he left just pumped like, this is so awesome that our pastors get to do this. Like they get to network, they get to process, they get to, you know, receive the, the word and, and not have to like be the ones up front, if you will. And so he just left totally ecstatic. And so my dad just wanted to say thank you that, uh, you know, you free us up as a staff to like go and to receive and to be a part of this, even though you kind of have to free us up. But he just, you know what dads are like. Thank you, though, from my dad that, uh, we got to do it. Was a, it was a really great, uh, you know, weekend as a whole. Um, and there's just so many uh, things that, you know, impacted us. And uh, one of the things I know Pastor Carlos is super passionate about, and uh, I am as well, is the thought around growing young in just the church as a whole. And how do we uh, process discipleship and reaching people in the next generation. And so that was, I know, a highlight for Carlos, a highlight for, uh, for me as well. So anyways, I just wanted to, to share a little bit about that uh, with you. But I, I, I want to get kind of like one of my um, pseudo soapboxes out, if I may, for just a moment and, and just say, you know, uh, what do you think about? What's on your mind? How do you spend your time? And so as I was thinking about this and, and prepping this, I'm going to one of my pseudo soapboxes, if you will. Uh, I 
decided to just take a quick look at the average Canadian's time on social media. I'm sorry. <laughs> and the average, as I looked it up, uh, you, know, I mean, you can find different sources, but it's really easy to work with certain numbers, so I went with this one because it was really easy. Two hours, two hours a day. In fact, literally, I walked up here, and my screen time report came up, and it was an hour and 50 minutes as I came up here. Now, I, you, you, that is not all social media. I work from these devices, okay, people? I have to work from them. But I'm talking social media, the average, okay, two hours. Like, think about that. That's kind of crazy. Two hours a day. Over the course of a year, that's 730 hours on social media. Okay? Now, Here's a little sign. I know that this is um, a little older than our second service gathering. By the way, you guys are awesome. I need to tell you this. Every session at district conference, they were like, um, don't be like your people and come late. That's our second service, by the way. <laughs> you guys are always 15 minutes early. It's awesome. I was like, I'm not listening to you. My people show up 15 minutes early. I'm good. You know? Anyways. Um, let's just go with the number 60. 60 is not old, okay, everybody? My dad's 70. I've never seen him more alive. Genuinely, I've never seen him more alive. He loves life. He's so excited about business, about faith. He's thinking about kingdom stuff in ways I haven't ever seen him think about. It's awesome, okay? 60 is not old. But let's just go with 60. Let's take a number that can work here and in the second service because I didn't want to create two openings. 60, this is 43,800 hours. People spend over 60 years on social media. That's five years of your life. Think about that. Five years of your life on social media. We live in a culture that things are ever-changing, and I get it all. There, most people, they don't even spend five years at a job anymore, yeah. right? Five years of your life. <clears throat> what a waste. If you were to go onto any of my social media, um, and by the way, Janelle does this regularly because we want to ensure that there's like purity of mind and heart for me, um, and we have means to like just track that kind of stuff. You will find all sorts of workout videos, meat cutting videos, and MMA and tackle big hits in football. <laughs> Five years of my life watching people get lean, cut meat, and punch each other in the face. What a waste! Seriously, what a waste. What do we spend our time thinking about, participating in what's on our mind? Colossians 3 moves us into this very topic today. Now, need to recap because I know what happened is we were going through in the New Year Colossians. We took a break over Easter and then went into a mini series that I really, really had on my heart and brewing. And so we're kind of needing to just go back and, and, and refresh our minds a little bit. And so in the letter of Colossians, uh, we recognized that in chapters one and two, Paul establishes so, so clearly two things. That Jesus is above all. He is supreme. He is the source. He is the authority. He is above all. And then he establishes that this one who is above all, the one true living God, as we come to faith in relationship with him, he's also in you. Let me show you what I mean real, real quick. quick. This is just one verse, uh, Colossians 1. 15, you could read this whole little mini section. It is meaty. It says this. Oh, meaty, that goes back to me. Cut, sorry. <sighs> Let's dissect this. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created. He is supreme over all creation. He is above all. 
And then he gets into, a little bit later in the chapter, uh, 1, 26, 27, this. This message was kept secret for centuries and generation past, but, um, generations past, but now it has been revealed to God's people for God wanted them to know the riches and glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too. This is the secret. Christ lives in you. The one who is supreme above all. The creator. So we enter into a relationship, have faith with God. He's in you. And he goes through one and two and sets this up again and again and again. And then in chapter three, he makes a shift. It's a shift now where we begin to see some of the implications of this. What is the practical realities of this? How does this apply to my life? How should this change who I am day by day? And we're going to look at that over the next couple of weeks as we wrap up this letter and see the practical implications of Christ being above all and in you. So here we are in three, a one to four. It reads like this. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven and not the things of earth. For you died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share and his glory. Now, when I'm getting ready, one of the things that, that I do and I, I make a kind of regular part of my practice is I, I read a text, look at it in a few different translations on purpose, and I look for some things that maybe are repetitive because there's always, if there is something repetitive, there's a, always an emphasis that's trying to be made in, when that's happening. And here we see in four short ver verses, Christ, 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 and Christ, and I'm not swearing. What's here? I said it because one time there was a, a, a gentleman who brought his granddaughter who wasn't uh, part of our fellowship, and, he, and, and she leaned over to Grandpa and said, Grandpa, that guy says Jesus Christ a lot. Is everything okay? <laughs> I thought that was funny when he told me that. Four times we see Christ repeated in this passage. And so here are some things that we need to take note of that ought to... Uh, uh, apply, have implications to us as those who recognize that Christ, that Jesus is above all and in us. And the first one is this, that we are raised in Christ. In fact, as you look at it as a whole, it says that you were raised to new life with Christ. And, and I know we had that gap, if you will, and so there's been a bit of a break, but if we wouldn't have had the gap of Easter and the tree of life, um, or sorry, the river of life, tree is my next Easter thing. I'm sorry, that, now you know where we're going in a year from now. Anyways, the river uh, of life um, series, uh, um, you would have recognized that when, when Paul writes this, he is repeating himself here as well. Since you've been raised to new life with Christ, what's he going at? Let's go back to 2, 11, and 12. This is really important. For when you came to Christ, you were circumcised, not by a physical procedure. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, cutting away your sinful nature. Graham talked about this last week because he talked about our heart, right? He, the procedure of the heart being made new. Then 12, you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. Here it is. And with him, you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. And when we come to faith in Jesus, this spiritual procedure on our heart takes place where he cuts away the things that are old. He makes us new. And then in the act of baptism, we symbolically Declare we are now with Jesus. This is why baptism is so, so important. Jesus takes on our sin when we come to faith in him. And he was buried. 
And so when we enter into the waters of baptism, we show that we're with Jesus by saying, look, in the same way that Jesus took on my sin and was dead, buried in that tomb, I'm buried. I recognize I'm dead in my own sin. But just as Jesus was resurrected, we have been raised to new life. We are made new in him. This has been so fun the last few weeks. We've had a number of people take the steps of baptism. And it's been incredible as we've been able to participate in that. If you have not been baptized and you know Jesus, we would love to talk with you. Don't hesitate. It's such a critical uh, step in our journey with him. Anyways, what I wanted to do, um, thank goodness we got Brother Will at the back. I said, well, we got to show the first service what's been happening. So we put together a little recap for you the last couple weeks. So you can celebrate with us in the steps that people have made as they have come and said, look, I'm with Jesus. He took on my sin. I was dead, buried with him, but I've been raised to new life. Why don't we take a look and watch this together? If you have not been baptized, it is a significant step. In that declaring of who we are and that we're with Jesus, it isn't just a declaring, you know, before your friends and family and environment like this. It's also a declaring in the heavenlies. The angelic and the demonic realm bears witness to moments like this, and it really matters. It's a symbol that we are with Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done, so none of us can boast about it, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things that he planned for us long ago. Awesome stuff, hey, like, God is, <laughs> God is seriously on the move, you guys. It's amazing that he's doing things, he's showing up, and that people are recognizing that they are raised with him. So that's the first time we see Christ come and show up in this passage. And then it goes on, we see it a second time, um, and, and it's this, it says that we, our sights are to be on Christ. Our sights are to be on Christ. Set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits, okay? Our sights are to be on Christ in the heavens where he sits. But then there's emphasis again within our own text, a repetition, if you will, in two. It says, think about the things of heaven. Our sights are to be on Christ and the heavenlies where he sits, we're to be thinking about the things of heaven. In fact, it goes on and it says, not of earth. So let's go back to like our original question. Like what's on your mind? What do you think about? What do you spend your time doing? Maybe it's on family. Maybe it's on uh, the things you got to do at home, the errands. Maybe it's on work. Maybe it's on more money. Uh, maybe it's on hobbies, interests. I don't know. In and of themselves, these things aren't bad. But when they become our singular focus, they can distract, can't they? What is our mind on? You know, um, this is a bit of a, a Ken-ism, if you will, and I know not everybody's wired like we, me, and so if you're not wired like me, it's okay. God is creative. He needs diversity. If uh, we were all like me, that would be a horrible, horrible reality. But for me, um, I really enjoy like listening to uh, a podcast and reading books that like speak to our mindset and not just Christian podcasts and books. Like I enjoy learning from like, doctors and psychologists and, and professionals who help me like hone in on my mindset and, and be excellent, okay? Um, one of my favorite ladies to listen to is Dr. Carol Dweck. She really um, has a lot to say on this topic of mindset. Most recently, uh, 
a couple books that I have I've read that I, I really enjoyed were Atomic Habits and The Power of One More. Like, I, I like this kind of stuff. This, what's my mind thinking on? What's my mind set on as a means to helping me be the best version of myself? Anyways, the, the last book I, I, I read on this topic, uh, The Power of More by, by Ed Millett, he talks about within it our RAS, our rectular, our, our rectular <laughs> activation system. I'm not the doctor, I'm the preacher. <laughs> Anyways, um, there are a number of things that our RAS affects, uh, but one of the things that it affects is just the way in which we perceive the world. It's actually a really interesting like, um, way to spend two hours on your phone um, Googling things. <laughs> RAS. Anyways, um, how we perceive the world. And, and, and he, he speaks to how the things that we set our minds on become the things that we see and we recognize. So here's a really silly example that I think a lot of you will get. So when I first bought my blue truck, all of a sudden I was driving around, so I'm so proud of my new blue truck. I'm like, shoot, there's a blue truck. There's a blue truck. There, there's, there's, there. Do you know how many blue trucks there are? So many, hey? You're like, oh, there's Ken. Oh, no, that's not Ken. It's just another blue truck, right? But that's what happens to us, okay? When things become important, we begin to think about them. Our mind naturally has a means to identify those things in the world, and we perceive the world through those lens. A very, very silly example, but I would be willing to bet something like that has probably happened to you. And then your mind will automatically filter out the non-blue trucks. That's what the RAS does, okay? So I'm... Pretty sure Paul had no idea about the RAS and what have you as he's writing this, but it is the same principle, isn't it? It's like the psychology lesson of 2,000 years ago. He tells us to set our sights on heaven, the things of heaven where Christ sits, to think about the things of heaven and not earth. What is our mind set on? What are we thinking about? How do we spend our time? Now go back to the original question and be honest with yourself in this moment. How does that affect how you perceive the world? How does it affect your day, your emotions, your highs, or maybe your lows? How does it affect the things that excite you or frustrate you? And we're gonna come back to this at the very end. Now, how would all that change if your answer was my sights, my mind, my thoughts are set on Christ first? And I'm, I'm guilty. I mean, I just listed some of the things I think about. How would it change for me? The first thing on my list was the things on my mind, the things I think about were Christ's. Our sights are to be on Christ. Then there's the fourth uh, time that Christ shows up. And your real life is hidden with Christ. You're hidden with Christ. This one stumped me when I first read it. In fact, I I actually kind of stepped back from my my preaching prep desk, um, closed my eyes. I've been talking to you guys about like our heart and the throne of my heart. I just went to this throne of my heart and said, said, like, Jesus, I, I don't understand this. The reason I don't understand is because when I think of that, didn't understand is when I think of that word hidden, I, I just, my mind went right to um, a childhood song I was taught. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm gonna, you know, oh, perfect, see? At least one person knows it, right? That's where my mind uh, went. I was like, well, but hiding's bad because I was thinking it from that perspective. So I just went to my spot. Okay, Jesus, like, what's going on here? Hidden in Christ, what do you mean? And so in the throne room of my heart, I, this is what I sensed. I sensed a question come to my mind. It wasn't audible, I just sensed a question come to my mind. Well, what do you do? The question was, what do you do with things that are valuable? And then immediately in my mind, I put them in my safe. Things that are valuable to me, I, I hide them in my safe. Uh, the things that matter to me, I protect, right? And this got me on the street, like, okay, so like hidden with Christ. Like if Christ truly is the most important to me. I got to take refuge in the fact that I'm hidden with him. I'm protected in him. And so then I pulled up back to my desk. 
um, and I have this software, it's really good, I'm not near as smart as I sound, I have a software that tells me this information, so just you know, let you know. Um, I, I clicked on the word hidden, and I went into like the original language, and it breaks it all down for me. Uh, Pastor Ash and Pastor Carlos now have the same software. I put it in the budget last year because it's really important. They only license it to one person. Da, da, da. Anyways, they got it now, so they can do this. Um, anyways, I put in the word hidden. It comes down, and here's what the word hidden means. This was funny to me. In Greek, it's original uh, form. It's the word crypto. I loved it. Oh, man. Now, I know the crypto markets are crashing and it's all kinds of things right now, but isn't that funny? Like uh, a, a financial system that's intended to like, you know, break free from the big boss and the big government, whatever, that's hidden off grid. Here's the word. Hidden in Christ. Protected. That relationship matters. Hidden in him. And then finally, this last time it comes up, it says this, Christ, your life. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. Christ is to become your life. All that you are, both here and now, and then ultimately one day in glory in heaven. The outworking, the practical implication of knowing that Jesus, that Christ is above all and now in you, is he becomes the focus of your life. It affects you both here and now in the ways we describe and ultimately one day in glory. This is so cool for me because I, I, in the 20-ish years or so now I've been a pastor the amount of times I've walked through horrible things with people and had them then look at me and with genuineness and broken heart and say, the only thing that gets me through this is I know Jesus and the hope of glory. The only thing that gets me through this, I know Jesus and the hope of glory. That's how powerful this is. That Jesus becomes our life and he's present with us. He works and moves and speaking within this life. And ultimately it gives us the hope of glory. We will be with him. And for those of you who may be guests or visiting or new or joining us online. If this has not yet happened in your life where you've uh, established that you are in Jesus. It is the most important thing that you can do. God created you and he designed you to be in relationship with him. And when sin entered the world, it wasn't God walking from us. It was we walked away. We went to our own sinful ways. This relationship was severed. It was, was broken. It was fractured. And so Jesus literally came 2,000 years ago. He literally, as we just talked about, uh, bore our sin. All of that which fractured, which broke, which separated us from God. He bore that sin. He died on the cross and made this final sacrifice that we could be forgiven, freed, cleansed of this. Then he was buried and rose to new life. And we too can know a spiritual procedure happens within us where God gives us a new heart. We're now forgiven and freed. And we're made alive in him. And he wants to do this in you. So why not today? You just got to come to him and say, Jesus, I'm sorry. Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, my life here. It's yours. This is what he longs for you. That relationship restored. And then you too get to go through the mountains and the valleys and have that hope of glory. Now how about for the rest of us who maybe know that already, have experienced that, and yet in the midst of the mountains and the valleys and everything that's up and down in our life, still struggle to have our minds set on the things of heaven rather than on the things of earth. One of my favorite verses is Romans chapter 12, one and two. It says, therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer yourselves, offer your bodies 
as living sacrifices. This is why we say, Jesus, here, my life is yours. I'm going to give it back to you, and I want to live for you. This is holy and pleasing. It's your spiritual act of worship. Oh, sure, we worship in song, and this is significant to praise together, but this becomes our spiritual act of worship, day by day, moment by moment. He goes on and says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So what is on your mind? What do you think about? And what do you need to pass back to him so that you can think more on the things of heaven and Christ who sits at the right hand of the Father? What do you need to pass back to him that your time might have Jesus listed as number one as opposed to the other things. And so I want to give us time right now to process this, uh, to meditate on this, and to consider this reality. And we've done this many times before, and I'm just going to get us back into this habit because I want us to learn the, the, the spiritual disciplines of listening to God. I, mean, I, I even talked about some of how that's happened for me in my prep. I want us to get into the to the, the, the habits and learn the rhythms that we can do on our own to connect with the almighty living God who wants to talk and meet with you. And so we're gonna use our SWORD acronym today. We're gonna read scripture. Our scripture is Colossians 3, one to four. I'm gonna read it from the message. It's just a very modern um, version that allows us to engage with it. And then we're gonna look for the W in sword, a word or a phrase that stands out. So look for a word or a phrase that stands out. Then we're gonna take some time to just quietly meditate, to make any observations in our heart. That's the O. Let Jesus prompt our mind as we think about the word or phrase that stands out. Then we'll move to the R and we'll repent. If there's anything that we need to repent of, we're gonna lay that at the foot of the throne. It was dealt with at the cross. Then we'll give a little space to finish in dialogue with Jesus. That's the deep. So here's the passage I want to follow along. I got it on the screen here for you. Look for the word. This is the S, the scripture. Look for the word that stands out or the phrase that just impacts you. So if you're serious about living this new resurrection life with Christ, act like it. Pursue the things over which Christ presides. Don't shuffle along, eyes to the ground, absorbed with the things right in front of you. Look up and be alert to what's going on around Christ. That's where the action is. See things from his perspective. Your old life is dead. Your new life, which is your real life, even though invisible to spectators, is with Christ and in God. He is your life. When Christ, your real, your real life, remember, shows up again on this earth, you will show up too. The real you, the glorious you. Meanwhile, be content with obscurity like Christ. So let's close our eyes. God, we recognize, as we've talked about for a number of weeks, that the river of life is in us available. The Spirit is moving. And so, Holy Spirit, we just invite you to move right now. Prompt our heart, prompt our minds. And so whatever word or phrase stood out to you, take some time to repeat it to yourself, to reflect on it, invite Jesus to just bring thoughts to your mind about that word or phrase. Make any observations now that you need to. Just be honest, it's okay, come back to them. No, I want to repeat that word or phrase that stands out. I want to focus in on that for just this moment. You and me, Jesus.
invite the Holy Spirit to convict us. If there's anything we need to repent of that's related to this, God, bring it to our heart, to our mind right now. take the time to dialogue with them. If there's things that you needed to repent, thank them now for the grace, the forgiveness. If there wasn't, thank them for the relationship that's been restored. Just enter into that dialogue of worship now with Jesus. this time.